Well, good morning. Welcome to, welcome to church this morning. Good to be with you all. My name is Gavin, I'm the pastor here at Grace Church. Thanks for joining us for worship today. As we begin, we have a few announcements that we want to highlight. Uh, the first, what you'll see on the back of your bulletin, is our Grace Women's Retreat. The retreat is April 19th through 21st. I encourage you ladies to attend. We have a, a great speaker that we brought in. The retreat is happening up at Estes Park. It should be a wonderful time to build friendships, study the word together, enjoy God's creation. So if you are in any way interested in going and you're thinking about the cost and don't know if you can quite swing the cost, then uh, definitely talk to me or uh, talk to Barbara Scott and we'll make sure that you're able to, to attend. We don't want cost to be a hindrance for anyone, but I encourage you ladies to attend. It should be a great time. So that's our, fir our first announcement, women's retreat. Second announcement is that we have our, our youth night for our third through fifth graders this evening. We always have our third through fifth grade youth night the first Sunday of the month. And so just a reminder for you families who have third through fifth graders, that starts tonight, 5.30 to 6.30 in the lower level. Encourage you all to come. It's a great time. And then last, I'm going to welcome up Nick, the chair of our missions committee, who's going to tell us about an exciting opportunity. Nick Bergen. Thanks, Gavin. Uh, so my name's Nick. I'm the chair of the missions committee here at Grace. Um, I wanted to let you know about an opportunity that uh, our church has to have a mission trip to our sister church in Izmir, Turkey. Uh, we're going to be going at the beginning of August. The intent of this trip is to basically be a really good brother and sister to our church in Tur to our sister church in Turkey, where it's difficult to be a believer. Uh, the idea is that over this long weekend, we would have a conference where uh, we'll review a book on prayer that they are currently translating into Turkish, um, and we would go through that with them and basically uh, study the word, fellowship, and uh, engage with them on that level. So the dates are August 1st through the 4th. Uh, we are opening uh, applications for members to apply to uh, attend the church. The, tr uh, the trip is going to be led by uh, John Hoppen and Mike Winsler. So for those of you who are interested in applying to go, we have space lim uh, limited space, so we're opening up applications. There's going to be a form in the back in the narthex that you can pick up or a little brochure. It tells you the, about the trip, who to contact, uh, and, and all that relevant information. But really importantly, there's a QR code at the bottom. That QR code is going to bring you to the application. So if you want to attend the trip, go ahead, access the uh, application through that QR code, and you'll be able to submit your application. So uh, applications will be open until the end of this month, so that's April 30th. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact John Hoppen or myself. We'll be happy to answer anything. Um, and I think that's all that I had, so thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. You'll find in your bulletin uh, our flow of our worship service today. And so as we begin our worship, what you'll see is that we have a call to worship. And the, the importance of highlighting this it is that it is the Lord who calls us to himself we don't initiate our relationship with God, but he initiates it with us. And so would you stand now and hear the call to worship? Excuse me. Excuse me. I messed up. Please sit down. I'm so eager to worship. Um, apologies. At the top of your bulletin, you will see the welcome and reflection. There is a quote that we have selected to prepare our hearts for worship. So please hear this quote as we start to think about some of the themes that we'll be meditating on today during our service. Entering the house of God to dwell with God, beholding, glorifying, and enjoying him eternally, I suggest, is the story of the Bible, the plot that makes sense of the various acts, persons, and places of its pages.
please stand as we hear the Lord's call to worship. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. Let's sing. Praise my soul, the King of Heaven, to His feet your tribute bring, ransom healed, restored, forgiven, who like me your praise should sing, praise Him. Gracious Heavenly Father, we, we do praise you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we praise you, Father, that Jesus died for our sins, that Jesus rose from the grave, and that Jesus ascended to your right hand where he intercedes for us even now. And we praise you, Father, that in your love, in your kindness, in your mercy, you did not spare your own son, but you graciously gave him up for us all. We praise you, Father, that you not only sent your son to die for our sins and to rise from the grave, but you sent your spirit, the spirit of Christ, to reveal the gospel to us, to enable us to see Jesus as beautiful, to enable us to trust in him, and not only that, to spur us on to good works, to love our neighbors, and to love our enemies. And we praise you, Father, that you have sent your Son and your Spirit into this world, and that as a result of the work of your Son and as a result of the work of your Spirit and the ongoing work of your Spirit, we are gathered here today all because of you. We praise you for rescuing us and then for drawing us to a time of worship. And we ask that as we gather around your Word, as we gather around your table, as we gather in prayer, as we gather in song, ultimately as we gather around your son, Jesus, by the power of the Spirit, we ask that you would fill us with joy, that as we bring our sorrows to you, that you would hear them, that you would comfort us, as we bring our sin to you, that you would hear that and that you would forgive us, as we bring our burdens and our pains to you, and as we lament to you, that you ultimately would would reassure us that you hear all things and that you are putting all things in order. Help us not to, to lose sight of the fact that Jesus will return and that when he comes, he will put all things in order. Things in our hearts, things in our physical bodies, things in our minds, the way that we don't understand why our minds don't work or our bodies don't work or our heart doesn't work the way that we want. Point us forward to the day that Jesus will return. Until then, we join together in this prayer that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. 
forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated. How wonderful it is that we have a holy God that we worship and uh, that that God also offers us forgiveness for our sins because we are not. As uh, the hymn stated, he is slow to chide and quick to bless. Let's hear this uh, scripture from Exodus 20, 2 through 3 that reminds us of our relationship to God. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. This is the word of the Lord. Let us confess together from the Book of Common Prayer our sins. Afterwards, you may take a moment to uh, confess your own sins in silence. Lord, we ask you, absolve your people from their offenses that through wonderful goodness we may be delivered from the hands of all those sins which on our frailty we have committed. Grant this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's stand for the uh, passage in Colossians 1 for our assurance of pardon. And you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Lord, with glowing heart I praise thee for the bliss I love thee. The pardoning grace that saves me and the peace that from it flows. Help, O oh God, my weak endeavor, this dull soul to rapture raise. Thou must light the flame or never can my love be. Praise my soul, the God that saw thee, wretched wanderer far astray. Found thee lost and kindly brought thee from the paths of death away. Praise the love's devoutest feeling, him who saw thy guilt-born the light of hope revealing bade the bloodstained cross appear. Praise 
thy Savior's God that drew thee to thy cross new life to give. Held a blood sealed part and to thee bade thy look to him and live. Praise the grace whose threats alarm thee, rouse thee from thy fatal ease. Praise the grace whose promise warmed thee, praise the grace that whispered Lord, this bosom's odd and feeling vainly would my lips express. Lo, before thy footstool kneeling, deign thy suppliant's prayer to bless. Let thy love, my soul's chief treasure, thus your flame within me raise. show forth thy praise. Let thy love, my soul's chief treasure, thus your flame within me raise. And since words can never measure, let my life show forth thy praise. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, our Holy Son, the Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's join me in singing the doxology. Praise God. Sorry, that was too high. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Come to the time of the service when one way we can show our love to God is through our generosity, just recognizing how God through Christ and the work of its Holy Spirit has been generous to us. And so we are, we'll be passing little baskets around to collect our tithes and offerings as a, uh, an expression of worship for our gratitude to the Lord. If you're visiting, uh, we don't in any way expect for you to give with everyone else, but uh, we just are thankful that you're here. So uh, as we prepare for that, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20 to help set our minds. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body.
your labor is not in vain oh the ground underneath you is cursed and stained your planting and reaping are never the same your labor is not in vain your labor is not unknown oh the rocks they cry out and the sea it may groan the place of your toil may not seem like a home but your labor is not unknown for I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, I am with you, for I have called, called you by name, your labor is not in vain. The houses you labor to build will finally with laughter and joy be filled. The serpent that hurts and destroys shall be killed, and all that is broken be healed. For I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. For I have called, called you by name. Your labor is not in vain. For I am with you. I am. by name your labor is not in vain just join me in prayer heavenly father we are so thankful for your presence with us here this morning in this most special way as we gather to worship you you fill this place with your glory, and we are so thankful to be part of that, that you have called us to join you, for you desire a relationship with us. Thank you uh, for your generosity and for working in our hearts to return that generosity to you. We just thank you, too, that you've given us your word, and we ask that you would soften our hearts and open our ears as we hear the reading of your word and the preaching of your word, that it would enlighten us and encourage us and even it might uh, prick us to draw closer to you in ways that uh, we were avoiding. Just thank you for your faithfulness to us and uh, we praise you through the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, children ages three through third grade are now invited to mosey to the back and line up to go down to uh, have a time of learning. And if you uh, would prefer to stay with your family, that is also fine. So we invite that. We just like this opportunity to encourage our children to join in the faith that we have. Today's scripture reading comes from Exodus 25, 1 through 9. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the people of Israel, that they take for me a contribution. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And this is the contribution that you shall receive from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue and purple and scarlet yarns, and fine twined linen, goat's hair, tanned ram skins, goat skins, acacia wood, 
oil for the lamps, spices for the anointing oil, and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and stones for setting, for the ephod and for the breastpiece. And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell in their midst. Exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make it. The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Thank you, Aaron. Well, this morning we continue our series in Exodus after a few sermons in John during Holy Week. The first thing that I want to mention as we turn to God's word is a a word of thank you. Uh, This week, when we look at Exodus 25, we're going to see that the themes touch on giving and that relates to money and resources and time and talents and gifts. And I want to open with a word of thank you to the people of Grace Church for their their generous giving of their, their tithes, their money, their skills, their time, their maturity. And that's the, the, the thing I want to open with, so that as you hear this sermon today, uh, what you're hearing is us do what we do, which is preach through the Bible. And our goal is to open up the next passage. The next passage happens to do with giving. And so my response when we look at the topic of giving, first of all, is to offer a word of gratitude. So hear that first, uh, because for our church to run uh, depends on your sacrifices. And I want you to know that I realize that. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would speak to us now by the power of the Spirit through your word. Would you uh, grant us a sight of Jesus that so humbles us and fills us with joy uh, that we desire to sing praises to you? We ask that you would do that by the power of the Spirit. We ask that you would do that for your glory. And we ask that you would do that for our joy. Amen. Well, there are few things more troubling than hearing stories about financial fraud and ultimately the innocent people who lose their hard-earned money through some scam. Some of you know people who have been scammed. I know someone who's been scammed. It is uh, painful because of the embarrassment. It's painful because of the loss, the anger, the frustration. And unfortunately, it's pretty common in in small ways and, and really large ways. One of the the largest ways we saw was 20 years ago when Bernie Madoff apparently defrauded his financial clients of roughly $15 billion. In the last five years, um, it's the story of Sam Bankman-Fried and his cryptocurrency fund, FTX, which lost about $8 billion for customers based on his fraudulent behavior. Now, not trying to make any judgment about these men, this is just what the courts have said about them. I bring these stories up, however, to illustrate how important it is that a financial services company be tied to actual reality and not just to to some imaginations of the person in charge or not some idea that they can ultimately pull it all together or, of course, just that they are maliciously stealing from people. These things are not going to, in the end, pay the bills. So it's important that a financial services company be tied to actual reality. Now, that's thinking in a very large category, billions of dollars, but it's actually true in small ways as well. Many of you probably use a banking app on your phone, I would imagine. Some of you at least do. I'm not saying you should or you shouldn't. I'm not intending to give any (laughs) advice about financial services in this message. Just know that. But I am bringing it up because it's fairly common to use a banking app. Imagine, though, if your Wells Fargo app or your, your Chase app had no connection at all to an actual bank. No connection. You would never manage your money through that app. It's not just um, that it would be unwise. You would be happy to know that you should just delete that. You would want nothing to do with that fake app. And the reason is the app or the financial service company must be tied to reality. This same principle undergirds our section of Exodus today. The way we handle our money must be tied to ultimate reality. I believe that this principle, that ultimate reality must be tied, must be tied to our finances, undergirds all of the financial sacrifices that we make for God. If our giving is not tied to ultimate reality, then it's a scam and should be avoided. Am I causing some feedback? 
Try me. Let me try this. Sorry about that. Okay. I'm going to try now. Is that, is that a little less of the, the rumbling? I thought it was the wind at first. <laughs> I really did. And not the spirit. I thought it was just... I thought it was the wind blowing trees down our street like it did last night. All right, should we start up? No, we're not going to start over. All right, let's continue. Okay, so an app or a financial services company must be tied to reality. This same principle undergirds our section of Exodus today. And I believe it undergirds all of the financial sacrifices we make for God. If our giving is not tied to ultimate reality, then it's a scam. It's a scam, and it should be avoided. Now, to put this another way, I believe that the people of God grow in their willingness to give to God when they are confident that God is the one receiving their gifts. The people of God grow in their willingness to give to God when they are confident that God is the one receiving their gifts. When I say ultimate reality, of course, I mean God. We need our finances tied ultimately to God. Now, I'm gonna, I think we're going to see that in this passage in three points. Verses 1 and 2 of Exodus 25 shows us the motive for giving to God. Verses 3 through 7 shows us the cost of giving to God. And then 8 and 9 shows us the goal of giving to God. The motive, the cost, and the goal of giving to God. Now let's start by seeing the twofold motive for giving to God. First, in verse 1, it is the Lord who is speaking. It is the Lord who has told Moses, this is what you are to say to the people of Israel. This is what you are supposed to say to them. When we, when we open up God's word, it is him initiating some topic with us. In this case, he's initiating the topic of their stewardship of their resources. He's initiating and he's giving them the opportunity to respond to that initiative. The first motive that's in play whenever we think about giving is that God is the one who initiates this topic. God is the one who brings it up. It's a topic that's actually on God's heart. That's why it's in his word. That's why he wanted his people 3,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago to talk about it, and that's why he wants us to talk about it. He initiates, and that tells us about what our motive should be. Our motive, when it comes to our finances, should be responding to God's will. That's ultimately what this first point tells us. He's the one who initiates, and so we want to see ourselves as responding to God when it comes to our finances. Now, the second reason, and the bigger one that I think we see from this passage, is is that it has to do with our hearts. The book of Exodus, in many ways, is all about the human heart. What happens to Pharaoh over and over again? The reason why he fails to respond to God, his heart was hard. Here we see in these verses that God wants his people to give if they are motivated in their hearts to do so. You look at verse 2. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution from me. God is aware that people can give financially for a variety of reasons, just like we can do anything for God for a variety of reasons. We can give for a variety of reasons. One of them is is because of compulsion. Another one is to appease our guilt. Another one is that we want to show others that we are generous. There's a variety of reasons we could give. But all three of these, compulsion, guilt, or vanity, are explicitly critiqued in the scriptures. Paul tells people in 2 Corinthians to not give because of compulsion. That is because you you just feel like you have to. I have no other choice. I have to. Nope, don't do that. Judas gave his money back that he received from the temple leaders after feeling guilty for betraying Jesus. Sometimes we give out of guilt. And then Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount not to sound a trumpet when we give. That is to show other people that we give so much. Some churches will put plaques up in a room when somebody uh, donates money. And ultimately, I, I think that's an unwise principle because Jesus said, don't, don't brag about your donation to the church. So people can give for a variety of reasons, compulsion, guilt, or to show others that we're generous. But instead of these wrong reasons, God tells us that he wants us to give because we want to. Because we want to. He tells us that he loves a cheerful giver in 2 Corinthians. Now, to try and illustrate this is is not that easy because it's a principle that we all know and understand. So I'm going to try 
and, and, and drive it home for us with a, a silly illustration from a movie. There's this movie with Jennifer Aniston and Vince Vaughn where they are in a fight. Aniston wants Vince Vaughn to help her do the dishes. Now, after she begs him while he's playing video games to do the dishes, he finally agrees. He finally says, okay, but he's got such a bad attitude that she says, hey, you know what, just forget it, okay? Just forget it. I don't want your help. And he says, I, I told you I was going to do the dishes. Why are you mad? And she says, I want you to want to do the dishes. And he replies, why would anyone want to do the dishes? Well, the needless to say, the movie is called The Breakup. <laughs> the point is that if we don't want to do something, it does not bless the person that we are helping. If we do it for compulsion, or if we do it to appease our guilt, or if we do it to show others that we're generous, it doesn't bless God. Motive matters when we give of our time and our resources and our skills. If one of you said, Gavin, love the sermon, I'd like to donate $10 to the coffee fund downstairs. We don't have one, just so you know. But just remember, you owe me. I'd say, uh, no, 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 no. Keep your $10. Even if it was a million dollars, I'd say keep your, your, your money. Our motive matters in our giving to God. If we do it to show off or because we just feel like we have to, it doesn't bless God. Now, we see this for two reasons. First, the obvious, he owns everything. He doesn't need our stuff. He created the world. He didn't create the world because he needed the world to then give back to him. That's not why he created the world. He created because he desired to grace creation with existence and fellowship with him. Now, imagine if a parent gave if, imagine if a child, excuse me, imagine if a child gave their allowance back to their parents and said, do you love me now? You understand the illustration? Imagine if a child gave their allowance back to their parents and said, do you love me now? That would be a sign it was time for some family counseling. But we have to remember that our giving is not responding to God, giving us something, and then us saying, do you love me now? No, he created it all. If he gives us anything, it's out of an overflow of his gracious pleasure that he wants to draw us into his divine life. Our motive matters. It's not just because he created everything. Our motive matters to God because motives determine, they're, they're a litmus test on relationships. If I give to God cheerfully, it demonstrates that the money it demonstrates that the money is not the basis of our relationship god's grace and god's joy and god's presence are generating joy in me that is the basis of the relationship that is the reason that god wants us to give he says if your heart moves you israelites if your heart moves you then you can contribute then you should contribute so the israelites who heard this had to decide do i actually want to give to God? I mean, do I actually want to? Now, that question is a very good question for us all to consider on occasion. Do I actually desire, as a response to rescue and redemption, to give sacrificially to God? Now, right away, we have to caveat. Does this mean that we must always have a burst of spontaneous joy each time we make a sacrifice for the Lord. If I don't have spontaneous joy flowing in me, I shouldn't give. No. no. That's not the implication. That would be a false dichotomy. There are times we do something sacrificial because we know it is the right thing to do. That's the bottom line. There are times that wisdom calls us to do things even if we don't have a burst of spontaneous, spontaneous joy. We are to do it because it's the right thing to do. Wisdom calls for it. To not do it would be sin. That's the reality of how our motives work. There are times where we just have to do it. Another reason that we might do something is because we've established a good habit, and the momentum from the habit carries us into a wise decision. That's a good reason. We don't have to have spontaneous joy, but rather the good habit can carry us forward and enable us to make a good decision. Or, 
Sometimes we obey God because we know that someday our joy will return. An exercise of faith in God that he will someday give us joy. If you're wondering if that's a real biblical concept, read the Psalms. All over the Psalms, the psalmists are crying out to God, expecting him to give them joy someday or some hour or some time or some decade or some year. The reality is in our Christian lives, we have to play the long game with our emotions. We have to play the long game. We have to think in decades. We have to think in generations about our joy. There are times when our joy doesn't spontaneously bubble up, enabling us to do the dishes, enabling us to love somebody, enabling us to give. All of these factors are legitimate and biblical, but occasionally, occasionally, we just need to ask, do I actually want to give to God? That's what this passage is is trying to get into us to bring about the question that enables us to answer, you know, I don't know if I do. I might just be in a habit that I don't even think about anymore. I don't even know why I do this. This passage comes along and encourages us to ask a hard question of ourselves. And, and as your pastor, I desire for us to have a, a, a foundation based on grace for the financial dimension of our relationship with God more than I desire for our church to have predictable and stable financial health. Let me say that again. I believe the Bible calls us to have a gracious foundation for the financial dimension of our relationship with God more, more than it desires for our church to have predictable and stable financial health. The reason this is clear from this passage is because why we give matters to God. Why we give matters to God. He tells them if their heart moves them, they are to give. You see, God is the one who is responsible ultimately for the financial help of this, uh, health of this congregation. He has delegated us the responsibility of cultivating joy in our hearts as the motive for our giving. He has delegated that responsibility to us. He has called us to cultivate joy in our hearts by dependence on his means of grace, by the power of the Spirit. And he has delegated to us to sacrifice as we give to God. He has delegated to us the task of cultivating joy in the Lord as the motive for our giving. And he has delegated to us to sacrifice as we give to God. Now this second point is seen in our second point of our passage. The concept of sacrifice is seen in the point that I'm making the cost of giving to God. Verses 3 through 7 outline all of the different supplies that people were invited to contribute to the, to the construction of the tabernacle. All of the different supplies needed. People were invited to give. Now, in later weeks, we're going to explore how these supplies are shaped into the tabernacle and how that makes this beautiful tapestry that all comes together in this wonderful way. But for now, simply note the beauty and the value of the materials. Precious metals, right? Gold and silver there in verse, verse 3. Beautiful yarn. Some of it's red. Some of it's purple. Animal skins that are already tanned, they've, they've already been worked on, they're ready for use, oil, spices, perfumes, precious gems. This is an invitation, but the point that I'm making is it's a costly invitation. Sometimes nonprofits or political lobbyists will host a dinner to raise money, and people are invited to pay for a table or a seat at the dinner, right? You've, you've heard of this. Some of you have gone to some of these dinners. Typically, the cost for a seat is far more than the nonprofit pays for the dinner. But that's the point, right? It's a fundraiser. Now imagine if the cost of the fundraiser, fundraiser was your wedding ring. Imagine if everyone had to just give their wedding ring. Well, you would, of course, be hesitant. But if the fundraiser was for cancer research, and you knew a person with the type of cancer, then you'd consider it. Now imagine if you had the cancer you'd happily give your wedding ring or whatever was the most valuable thing that you had in exchange for the chance for your life being spared by the discovery of a cure. All of a sudden, the cost would be nothing because of your personal investment in the mission. All of a sudden, the cost of, of something very valuable to you wouldn't be even a sacrifice at all because of your personal investment in the mission. These are costly things that the Israelites were invited to give. But the personal investment in the mission 
enables them to think about their giving as an act of joy, as an act of their heart moving towards them. This is how God wants us to think about our giving, as a sacrifice for his mission because we are personally invested. Now, I'm not hoping to see any wedding rings in the offering bag next week. Don't do that, okay? I mean, if you do, we'll find a way to liquidate it, all right? Don't worry. Just kidding. I'm trying to help us imagine what is on God's heart for our giving so that it shapes our hearts when we give. I'm trying to help us imagine that God wants us to be personally invested in his mission as a response to his mission of rescue. He wants us to think about the fact that this mission that we're giving to ultimately enables us to know him more. I'm trying to help us imagine what is on God's heart for our giving. Why? So that it shapes our hearts when we give. Now, this ultimately leads to our, our third point. The goal of our giving. The goal of our giving, verses 8 and 9. The goal of our giving is to dwell with the God who gives his very self. Do you see how we are personally invested in God's mission? The goal of our giving is to dwell with the God who gives his very self. The people of Israel had a decision to make when God told them, when Moses told them what God said. They had a decision. Did they want their stuff, which they got for free from the Egyptians when they left Egypt? Do you remember all the Egyptians started just giving them stuff, basically saying, get out of here, get out of town, here's all the stuff, just take it. Did they want their stuff, or did they want a sanctuary in their midst that God would dwell in? Now look at verse 8. Let them make me a sanctuary. Why? That I may dwell in their midst. The question for the Israelites to consider is when they look at their gems, at their beautiful, their beautiful yarn, their gold, their silver, their bronze, when they look at all of their materials, their time, they were going to have to build this thing, remember? Their skills, when they look at all of that, the question that that the Lord, through Moses, is encouraging them to consider is whether they want this stuff or whether they want God to dwell in their midst. Now, do you ultimately see how giving is about our hearts? God wants us to consider that we already are personally invested in his mission. His mission is to draw us to himself. When we give to his mission, it is as though we are donating to a cause that's ultimately going to bring a cure for us. The difference is he's already brought the cure. He's already rescued us. He's already drawn us out. He's already, at the expense of his own son, ensured that we are personally not just invested in the mission, but that we are benefited from the mission, that it is already done, that the mission is over on our behalf. He is inviting us to be personally invested in that mission of dwelling with him. God initiated the topic. God initiated the topic because he wants the hearts of his people. He wants the Israelites to consider what they actually want, to consider what they're actually aimed at, to consider what they're actually willing to sacrifice for. I'm not coming to you asking you to give more to some project right now. I hope you know that. I'm not. I'm not asking you to give more to our, our, our weekly giving I open with gratitude, and I hope that that's the main point. I'm preaching the next passage in the book of Exodus. And what that means is that God knows that we need to hear about the relationship between our hearts and money and him. God knows that we need to hear about the relationship between our hearts and our resources and our relationship with him. This is God's agenda for helping shepherd us towards greater and greater joy in his son. This is God's agenda. God is interested in talking about how we treat our resources because he ultimately wants to dwell with us and he wants us to want to dwell with him. I believe God has the following to say about our resources. The people of God grow in their willingness to give to God when they are confident that God is the one receiving their gifts and that as they give to God, they grow in their fellowship 
with God. That's ultimately the point of this passage. As they give to God, what's going to happen? They're going to build a little sanctuary, a little tabernacle, and what's going to happen? God is going to dwell in their midst. They're giving, and their hearts and the presence of God are all intimately connected. They're all intimately connected. He wants to speak to us about our resources so that he can cultivate joy in our hearts towards his presence. That's God's agenda for our passage. That's God's agenda for us to think about this week. And it's a really hard, it's a really hard topic. It's really hard to let go of our, our resources. It's really hard to know how to steward them. It's really hard to know how much and what is wise. This is very difficult. I mean, the point of all this is not to say the obvious thing right now for you to do is go and give. No, no. The point of all of this is for us to consider how to grow our desire to want more of God's presence. And that one of the vehicles God uses for growing our desire for more of his presence is our financial resources, is our time. That's the point of this passage. The goal of our giving is to make a joyful, joyful sacrifice to the God who redeemed us, who redeemed us, who redeemed us, a joyful sacrifice in response to the God who redeemed us so that our hearts are less and less and less tied to the things that ultimately don't even bring us joy. I mean, we live in a, a consumeristic culture. We're constantly bombarded with temptations to buy more and more and more stuff. But what does a consumeristic culture do? It consumes the people in that culture. That's what it does. It consumes them. We are all living amidst a, temp a, a, a culture that is tempting us to constantly think that more stuff equals more joy. That's how a consumeristic culture works. We're constantly bombarded with ads, with advertisements. We're constantly bombarded with things we think we need to buy. It's constant. Why? Because a consumeristic con culture consumes us. It consumes our joy. It makes us increasingly, increasingly unsatisfied with the materials that God has given us. That's what a consumeristic culture does. And that's the culture we live in. People are trying to sell stuff. Sure, there's such thing as, as a as good economy, and I'm not trying to overstate my point, but we live in a moment where you can't surf the internet without being specifically targeted for an advertisement that's been tailor-made for you. That they know exactly what you want, whoever they is, <laughs> and they are trying to sell you something. We live in a culture that is designed to make us, to make us not content with our resources. And the Lord is coming along and he is encouraging us to just, to just think about the relationship between our resources, our hearts, and his presence. That's what this passage is intended to do. Now look with me at verse 9 as we conclude. God wants the people to make a sanctuary that is exactly like the heavenly sanctuary. Listen to what he says. Make the sanctuary exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture. That's how you're supposed to make it. They were to make a heavenly replica, a little, a little tabernacle that represented the heavenly temple. Moses was going to see the heavenly temple. God was going to give him a vision of the heavenly temple and this invisible spiritual temple that God dwells in, this real thing, this real thing is what they were supposed to model the earthly tabernacle off of. What God is doing in this sermon, in this, in this passage for these people, is he is telling them, give your resources to ultimate reality. The tabernacle is meant to replicate the real heavenly temple. This was God's way of showing the people that earthly worship was patterned on heavenly worship. Their, heaven, their earthly tabernacle matched the heavenly tabernacle, and by this exact replica, the people were making a sanctuary fit for God to dwell in. God wanted his people to be sure that they were giving to him, that it wasn't just a broken app, that it wasn't just some Ponzi scheme. No, the gifts that they were giving to build this little tabernacle were connected to the heavenly reality of the ultimate temple where God has dwelled in forever. forever. The people of God were to grow in their willingness to give to God. Why? Based on their confidence that this little tabernacle was directly connected to the ultimate reality of the universe, God's dwelling place. I mean, I would be irate 
if I found out a nonprofit was stealing my donation and using it for something different than what they originally told me. I mean, I'd be irate. We need to be confident that we're actually giving to God. When they were invited to sacrificially participate because their hearts moved them, moved them, when they were invited into that, God was trying to convince them this gift is connected to ultimate reality. Your financial resources, this is what he's telling the Israelites, your financial resources are connected to this little tabernacle, which is a replica of the heavenly temple. They didn't have to wonder if there was a a real bank behind all of this. No, it was a direct model. The direct model, why? Because then it would be fit for God to dwell in. And then God would be in their midst and their financial resources would be contributing in a personal way to his mission of dwelling with his people. We need to be confident that we are actually Hebrews 9, 11, and 12. When Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, tent is tabernacle, then through the greater and more perfect tent, the one not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by the means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. The author of the Hebrews is telling us what's going on in the heavenly tabernacle. The word tent means tabernacle. What do we know about this tent? It's not made with hands. It is the spiritual heavenly tabernacle. What's going on in heaven? What's going on in heaven? The the, the heavenly worship, the heavenly temple, the heavenly tabernacle? Jesus is offering his blood to secure our redemption. That's what's happening in the heavenly tabernacle. The God-man has entered into the Holy of Holies, not in some little replica, not in some little um, imitation of the real thing. No, into the actual Holy of Holies in the heavenly temple, the heavenly tabernacle. And what has he done? He has offered his own blood and secured eternal redemption for us. That's what's going on right now in the universe, in the heavenly tabernacle. The atoning sacrifice of Christ is the focus of the heavenly temple. Now, I had a visitor once tell me that here at Grace, we focused a lot on the blood of Christ. They were a little confused by that. I was so honored. I was so honored. That means that we are focusing on the heavenly temple. The more we focus on what is actually happening in the heavenly temple, the more we actually focus on the gospel of God, the more that we focus on the blood of Christ, the more we focus on the fact that by his own blood, not by the blood of bulls and goats, by his own blood, he has secured an eternal redemption for us, and that that is what is going on in the ultimate reality of the universe. The more we focus on that, the more we can be confident that our giving is actually given to God. I hope you see the connection they were to build a replica of the heavenly temple and it make it exactly like the one Moses saw in his vision. Exactly like it. We know exactly what is going on in that heavenly temple. Christ's blood offered for our sins. They were to make an exact replica. We are to make an exact replica. We are to focus on the eternal redemption won for us by the blood of Christ. Not with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood. The more we focus on that, the more our worship is is saturated with the blood of Christ and the resurrection of Christ. The more we focus there, the more we can be confident that our giving is actually given to God. The more we focus on the gospel, the more confidence we have that God is in our midst. Why? Because the gospel is on display in the heavenly temple, and we want it to be displayed in this little microcosm of God's temple. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, we read? That God's spirit lives in you? We are the temple of God. This building's beautiful. It's not the temple of God. We are God's temple. And he dwells in us collectively. And the more we focus on replicating in our earthly temple, that is us, what is going on in the heavenly temple, the more we focus on the gospel, the more we focus on the good news that Jesus died for our sins, the more he dwells in our midst and the more confidence that we can be that our giving is given to God. Hopefully the point is clear. 
we are to joyfully respond to the gospel of God. It ensures that he is with us, and it ensures that we are with him. The more we focus on this truth, the more our hearts are freed up when we ask the question, do I even want to? And we can actually respond with, you know, he died for my sins, and he rose from the grave for me. I desire to respond to that with cheerfulness. Or, or we can say, Lord, I don't have joy in my heart when I give, but I want to play the long game on my emotions, and I'm going to trust you to grow joy in my heart. Or, or, we can build virtue into our lives in such a way that when we think about what we want our lives to ultimately be built on, we say, even if my heart is not quite where I want it to be, I'm going to get on my knees and plead with God to grow in me a joy for his name and his presence to be magnified in my midst. Now, these are all the options for us. The resource question is ultimately a vehicle to get at our hearts. The resource question of what to do with our giving is ultimately focused on our hearts. I hope that what you heard today, I hope that what you heard today is that Jesus has died for our sins and that the more we focus on that, the more confidence we have that he is in our midst. And the more confident that we are that he is in our midst, the more confident we can be that our giving, our service, our time, everything we do is actually focused on God and not ourselves. And this is what we want. We don't want to be subject to some scam. We don't want to find out that that there's some fraud going on. No, we want our giving to be given to God. The more we ensure that that is happening by focusing on the gospel, the more we can rest, the more that we can rest that we are personally invested in his mission. When you think about your giving, I urge you, I encourage you, I plead with you, I plead with you to focus on your hearts. Focus on your hearts. And the way to change your heart is to focus on God's heart. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, um, when we think about this heavenly temple, we ask that you would expand our imaginations to know what this even means and then ground our imaginations in the truth that we are to focus on Jesus week in and week out, his death and his resurrection on our behalf. Let us not be in any way distracted from him. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. Well, another way that we know about the heavenly tabernacle is by meditating on the fact that we are on a trajectory to what is called the wedding feast of the Lamb. The wedding feast of the Lamb is going to happen in the heavenly temple, the heavenly tabernacle, where where God's people enjoy a feast with God. Now this little picture of that feast, this picture through wine and bread and juice, this little picture is ultimately pointing us forward to the ultimate reality of the universe, which is that the Lamb was slain. The lamb was slain on our behalf. And so when you see this this wine or this juice, when you see this bread, what Jesus wants for you to do is to think about the heavenly temple, that the lamb who was slain is the one who is worthy to open the scrolls. The lamb who was slain is the one who ultimately invites us to himself and, and, and encourages us and pleads with us to welcome his presence into our hearts by faith, by by feasting together. And so when you take this meal, I encourage you to be thinking that it is causing you to be more and more united to Christ, that your union with your Savior is growing by the power of the Spirit as you eat this bread and as you drink this wine, which is ultimately enabling you to feast on Jesus himself by the power of the Spirit. And so when you come forward, uh, be thinking about how this is about you growing in your union with Christ. Now, if you haven't um, put faith in Christ to begin with, if you think about this meal or you think about the, the message that you just heard, and you think, I don't know if I believe that. 
then I would encourage you to, to pass on the bread, pass on the wine, pass on the juice, and instead, really consider whether, whether you want to put your faith in Jesus. Think about that, that he welcomes all who come to him. If you are here and you're not sure if you have put your faith in Jesus, I encourage you to, to invite him to come and dwell in your heart by faith, by looking to the cross, looking to the resurrection, and acknowledging that he died for your sins. But if you have done that, if you have put your faith in Jesus, then know that on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it so that we would remember that his body was broken. And then he took a cup and he poured it out and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is said, shed for the remission of your sins. He is inviting you to come and feast on the gospel, the story that is true of the heavenly tabernacle right now. So the way we celebrate communion here at Grace is we come forward in groups. I encourage you to come forward now. Feast on Jesus in your hearts by faith. Come forward.
Let's stand and sing. of true delight my unseen adore unveil thy beauties to my sight that I might love thee more oh that I might love thee more thy glory or creation shines but in thy sacred word I read in fairer brighter Dying Lord, see my bleeding, dying Lord. Tis here where ne'er my comforts droop, and sin and sorrow rise. Thy love with cheering beams of hope, my fainting heart supplies. Oh, my fainting heart supplies. Thus, my Lord, my life, my light, come with blissful rain. Break radiant through the shades of night, chase my fears away. Won't you chase my fears away? Break radiant through the shades of night, and chase my fears away. Won't you chase my fears away? love that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe. And in thine ocean's depths its flow may richer flow. Light that followest all oh my way, I rest my flickering torch to thee. My heart restores its borrowed ray, and in thy sunshine's blaze its day may bright. That seeketh me through pain, I cannot close my heart to thee. I lay in bow through the rain and feel the promise is not vain. That morn shall tearless. Cross that lifteth up my head. I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust like glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms red, like that shall end. Now receive the Lord's good word, his benediction. May the God of peace, who, brought, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.